Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Preston Ulmer, and uh, I'm, I come from the progressive epicenter of the Midwest, Springfield, Missouri, okay? So, it's, oh, we have a Springfield, for, it's not, if that made you nervous, oh, just wait, we're going to have a good time this morning. Uh, I, I first want to start by saying thank you to Pastor Jason, Pastor Veronica. Can we give it up for your pastors? They are incredible people, and listen, they... The authenticity they lead with just shows that they know they are fully accepted by God and that they are called, and I'm just so grateful that there are pastors like that um, in this world and in Bakersfield, California, and I know you are as well. But uh, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to be with you today. It's hot here. I almost wore shorts on stage, but I didn't think that would be appropriate, uh, but it is hot, so I went with black pants instead, and that was, that was a good choice. <laughs> To all the fathers, happy Father's Day. I'm so glad that you are um, leading the family. And we're going to talk about today, uh, it is a Father's Day message in a way, but, I, but it's going to apply to fathers in this way. We're going to talk about leading your family to a Jesus-looking God, okay? But we're also going to talk to the people. Now, this is going to apply to everyone. Raise your hand if this applies to you. To the people who have a dad. Raise your hand. You have a dad? It applies to all of us. Now, maybe you say, yeah, I have a biological dad, but it's not a dad that I know or that I wanted to know. Maybe you say you had a great dad. Maybe you had a present dad, you had an absent dad. Maybe you wish your dad was more absent than present. I don't know what it is, but in all honesty, the message applies because anytime we talk about the Father, God, the Father... Um, we take what we know on earth and we project it up into the heavens, and that's where we get confused. And then it becomes this process of what is truly God and what is truly God's authority and, and what's not. And then we start to kind of deconstruct and pick that apart, and that's what we're going to talk about. And it's important that we get to a Jesus-looking God today because for two reasons. One is that's got to be your foundation. Jesus has to be our foundation, firm foundation. Uh, the Bible talks about him as our cornerstone, and, and here's why as well, because he talks um, in, in a part of the, uh, the scriptures called the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the persecuted, and then he ends that whole entire passage by saying, if you do what I've told you to do, it's like building on a firm foundation, and when the storms come, because they will come, you know, like nobody's where they thought they would be. Physically, emotionally, relationally, psychologically. I mean, nobody is. The storms come. Detours happen. When that happens, he said, if you build your life on me, you're building on a firm foundation. And he said, but if, if you build on something else, you're building on shifting sand. So the, one of the reasons why we have to get to a Jesus-looking foundation today is because that's the only thing that will hold up your faith, the only thing that will hold up your life. The second is this. If the faith doesn't look like Jesus, the next generation doesn't want it. They don't want it. They don't want a faith that's your preferences and your personal legalisms. They, they want a Jesus-looking faith. And, and uh, the research shows this. The stats show this. The interviews I did for my new book, they show this. I mean, this is people are intrigued by Jesus. They're saying things like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, right? You can ask people who are far from God, atheists, agnostic, what do you do with Jesus? And what a compelling conversation that is. But they want a faith that looks like Jesus, or they don't want it. And, uh, and we can no longer outsource to our kids. If you are a father here, hear me clearly. You can't outsource to your kids their spiritual formation. We can't do it. It's not about just having them in church. It's not about just having Christian friends. You must model what it looks like to get to a Jesus foundation. You must do it. You are the greatest example. In fact, I, I put it like this. If we outsource the spiritual formation of our kids, they will always outgrow the faith they receive, 100% of the time. But when they could watch someone going fierce after Jesus, and you know this because you either had it or you didn't, but today we'll do it, okay? Today we're going to go after a Jesus foundation. Let me pray, and we'll jump right in. God, Thank you for Father's Day. Thank you for a day where we could celebrate having fathers in the world and in this room. Would you bless them? Would you give them a sense of not just encouragement, but give them a sense of purpose if they feel like they woke up without one? 
Uh, I just ask that you would let this day be a great day for every father in the room. And Lord, for every one of us, for every one of us that know you as a heavenly father, we need to see you clearer today. So we pray you'd help us to get to the Jesus foundation so that we can see you clearly and follow you better. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you about sometimes when we pick up these beliefs along the way that betray us, okay? They're beliefs that have been kind of brought into Christianity, and before you know it, you're like, oh, I don't think that that resembles a Jesus-looking faith. I don't think that it does. These beliefs can betray us, and you can pick it up from your house. You can pick these up from church. You can pick these up from yourself and your own authority. I picked this up when I was seven for the first time. It's when I was seven years old, is the first time I accepted Jesus into my heart. And if you're like, first time, I thought that there was like, how many times do you have to do that? Well, I was, you know, I went to a youth group where they're like, if you sin, come back up this week and accept Jesus back into your heart. So, I mean, you're in youth, so you're like, every week. How many times do I got to come to the front? So this is the first of hundreds, I don't know, <laughs> of hundreds. First time, seven years old, I'm sitting on my dad's shoulders. And we are at a power team event, which is... Uh, it's a group of guys with huge muscles, and they're going to, like, tear open phone books, and they're going to break bats on their knees. I don't know. They're going to do all this stuff, okay? They're power team. They're muscular. Think 80s rocker, long hair. Some of them, well, now they're bald. I just looked up a picture of them last night, but, <laughs> but you know, back then, they had great hair. So picture that. And this power team was called Sons of Thunder, which is, yeah, I know. That's just dynamic, Right? So I'm sitting on my dad's shoulders, and I'm watching it, and I watch this guy tear open this phone book, and all of us are like, yeah! And then I've recently learned um, you can put a phone book in an oven and heat it up, and then anyone can do that. So it's not that impressive anymore. But at, at a seven-year-old, I'm like, awesome! He's blowing up water bottles with his lungs, you know, like, and then it explodes. Like, now if my kid tried that, I'd be like, no, no, honey, don't do that. But it was impressive back then. There was even one where <laughs> this guy... This guy laid on a bed of nails and got a block of ice to put on his chest. And then another son of thunder got a uh, sledgehammer and in the name of Jesus went boom and broke it on his chest. Okay, it just like, like shattered. And the guy gets up and we're all speechless. And he goes, I'm okay, you know, which was an excuse to show his back muscles, right? I'm sure that that's all that was. And we all cheered and it's so stupid. I don't know why we... But this is when I first felt betrayed by a belief that I picked up from a Christian event. Um, they said, if, I'll try to do it in their voice, um, if you want to be strong like us, okay, that's what they, or, or they actually said, if you want more power than we have, on the count of three, I want you to run to the front. I'm seven, okay, like, now I still like superheroes. At seven, I was like, I loved them. I want to be strong. I want to be a superhero. That was my aspiration in life. So I get off my dad's shoulders, and he's like, one. And I remember my older brother was there, and I'm thinking, I don't know how much power God has to give today, but I got to outrun Sean. I got to outrun him. Two, three, we run to the front. And, you know, it's all crowded and hands up, and he says, okay, repeat this prayer. And Jesus, I accept you in my heart. And I'm like, Jesus, I accept you in my heart, my muscles. I accept you everywhere you need to be. Give me power. And then it's, amen, everybody starts cheering. And to this day, nothing's changed, okay? <laughs> it never worked. My dad pulled me aside, and he was like, no, no, Preston, this is, uh, they're talking about spiritual power, not physical power. I'm like, I don't care about spiritual power. I want physical power. <laughs> and whether it's funny, you picked up a belief that was betrayed you, or sometimes the beliefs we pick up, the things we incorporate into our Christianity, sometimes it's cruel and divisive and incredibly dangerous, actually. And you, you kind of know how this works. I probably don't have to tell you, but it, the way that it happens, what makes it so confusing sometimes to see God clearly through the mess of it all is because we have um, people that have a cognitive bias or they have uh, an agenda and they will attach that to a Bible, to, to like a chapter and a verse and then they will leverage that and they'll say, for you to be a Christian, you have to believe the Bible and if you believe the Bible, then you believe this and the way that I think about it and the way that I, and then you're like, but I don't think that I believe that 
and it's their opinion, and they say, well, if you don't believe that, then you don't believe the Bible. And it becomes very confusing. In fact, this would explain why so many people are participating in this big, scary word, deconstruction. Deconstructing. They're deconstructing their faith. I'm, you may have heard about this word from Instagram and TikToks or whatever, but let me give you a definition of deconstruction. Deconstruction is the picking apart of a tradition, a belief, or a system and testing it for its truthfulness and its usefulness and its effectiveness. Saying, I, I want to know if that thing that I picked up or that I was taught or that's being taught, is it truthful? Is it useful? And is it effective? Now, why sometimes people are so scared of this word, I'm telling you, if you are a father in this room of children that are young or old, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you will have to lead the way on this. Why it's so scary is because it resembles two words. One is deconversion and one's destruction, but they're very different. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about deconstruction. And if, by the way, if your faith is not allowed to grow up with you, you will deconstruct your faith either intentionally or eventually. Meaning, you will initiate questions that will make you start to pick things apart and realize, okay, I got to see God clearly. I, I need to see Jesus. Either you'll initiate those questions or life will do it for you. Something will happen. Sickness, divorce, uncertainty, loss of job, And before you know it, you're starting to pick apart, is this truthful, is this useful, is this effective? You're not the only one who feels like this, by the way. There's, I mean, statistically, eight out of ten people are probably participating in this, and it is not necessarily bad. Let let me tell you kind of what it reminds me of. It reminds me of Django, which I got to say, kudos to the person who brings this out every service, because if I was in charge of bringing out a Django set... On a table, I'm like, I'm, I'm calling in sick. So Jenga, our faith's kind of like this. The way to compromise all of Jenga is to hit the foundation, isn't it? Like, if you ever played Jenga, if I'm like, let's play Jenga, and I go for this one, you're like, this guy's an idiot. He's going straight for the foundation. The way to, that's the way to compromise it. But our faith, that's why we say we're getting to the foundation. Deconstruction is a foundation issue. It's getting to what have I built my life on? And can it withhold all of life? And and so you'll pick some things apart. I I know you're supposed to use one hand, but my kids aren't here, and so I changed the rules today. Like this, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Maybe hypocrisy is why you're like, "I'm, I'm, I'm testing things now. I have questions. I have doubts. Maybe you know someone. I'm sure you do. It says hypocrisy is what's causing all the questions and all the doubts. Maybe it's like this. Don't tip over. Don't tip over. Maybe it's bureaucracy in the church. Maybe it's the fact that you're like, I just don't like the... I, may, for you, the word religion and tradition might be really hard. And it was hard for a lot of Jesus followers as well. We'll get to that today. Don't worry, we're not going to just pick this apart all day. I'm just showing you. And then maybe it's, oh, personal experience, personal experience. Like you, you may be watching online or at the Northwest campus, or you may be here because it's Father's Day and, and you're like, <laughs> I don't know, I wanted to come to church on Father's Day. But the reason you don't go to church is because you've been to one before, right? Personal experience might be causing you to deconstruct your faith. And whatever it is, you're picking it apart. And if this is you, if you are here and you're going, I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm not wanting to get rid of God. I don't want to get rid of God, but I just have so many questions. And you find yourself picking it apart. I, I want to tell you something. If we were sitting having coffee and you were writing on this, I, I would say, write down what it is for you. And I'd look you in the eyes and I'd say, good for you. Honest, this is honest of you. And you figure something out that a lot of us haven't figured out. And it's that you're leading with authenticity. And it's that questions don't ruin your faith. Questions reveal the foundation. A bad foundation ruins your faith. That's what ruined it every time. When we get to the bottom, 
of our faith, the foundation. If it's not Jesus, what a good time to build a new foundation, right? And if it is Jesus, what a great time to reconstruct and rebuild. Because your faith has to grow up with you. It does. That phrase, uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, you've heard that phrase? It's from Germany in the 1500s, and it was used as a word of caution, actually. And it was like this, in your zeal to get rid of what's hurtful and harmful, take it apart. Do not get rid of what is lasting and true and helpful, whatever word you do. Don't get rid of all of it. So I, I would tell you, if, if you are deconstructing your faith, or if you're helping someone who's doing this, or at the end of this, maybe you're going to commit to helping them. Don't throw baby Jesus out with the bathwater. It's, it's something we want to get to the foundation. Foundation always equals authority. It's an authority issue. The foundation of your life will always reveal the authority of your life. And so I know Jesus was on the scene about 2,000 years ago, a little over 2,000 years ago. I think he's back on the scene, not like walking among us. I'm not going to in that message. But I think he's back in that he's at the forefront of more people's minds than we think. Like, we're in the third year in America where the largest religious group is, and this is in the history of America, it's never happened before, it was never this way, and we're in the third year. Um, the largest religious group is the irreligious, and it's made up of, and that would mean non-religious, it's made up of four different categories. Nuns, not like nuns, okay, but like N-O-N-E-S, non-religious, like they, they'll be like, I don't have a theological home. Duns, done with religion, the second one. The third one, exvangelicals, meaning that, that's a camp that kind of started in the early 2000s. And then the fourth one is the deconverted, all of which used to say they, they were Christians. It's the third year in a row as of 2022, and I'm sure 2023 will reveal we're still going up in this. If the church says, don't deconstruct your faith, don't do it, don't deconstruct your faith, will lose entire generation. If you see this as, what did Jesus say about it? You'll probably find he led the way in it because it's a foundation, it's an authority issue. Anytime someone says, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, oh my goodness, are they not doing this? You've heard it said, but I say unto you. He's establishing his authority. Jesus is establishing his authority. And the clearest picture we have of God is in Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The clearest picture. And we have to believe that again. That's the foundation. That's the faith that will last your life. That's the faith that will last for your family. That's the faith that will be received by the next generation. So Jesus is on the scene, and he, you can read any of his biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or, and they're going to give, anytime he's talking to a religious leader, he's establishing his authority. He's really setting some things up. And, uh, and Mark chapter 7 is where we're going to jump in now. Mark chapter 7 is where the religious leaders approach Jesus. And I want to show you how Jesus gets his authority at the foundation. But in order to do that, he has to deconstruct some things and his followers would be wise in doing the same thing. And I'm telling you, as I'm speaking, I know some of you are receiving this like, ah, that's me. And we'll talk in the lobby, and you might say, those are some words that maybe you didn't have before, but now you have. But if it's not you, I know you know someone that is doing this. And so we're gonna, I'm going to give you a really practical way to pick apart tradition, beliefs, and practices and to test them and to find the authority of Jesus in the end. And I hope you do it for your families, but I hope you do it for yourself because you're leading back to a Jesus-looking God. Mark chapter 7. It uh, says this. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled. That is unwashed. That's just disgusting. Anytime, if we go out to lunch, please wash your hands. I don't, I'm not germ. I'm not. I'm scared of germs. Okay. Verse three. I mean, I'll shake your hand, but then I'll immediately wash my hands afterwards. For the Pharisees. And all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly. I, you can teach your kids this. This is a good verse for them. Holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. It's like wash your hands, do the dishes. Okay? So if in kids' church, be like, what would you learn? 
Because here's what we learned. You've got to do the dishes today for Father's Day. Okay, verse 5. <laughs> oh, let me tell you why they did this, by the way. It wasn't because they were scared of germs. The knowledge of germs wasn't really developed like it is today. They actually believed that if there's dirt on something or if something's dirty and you consume it, you're actually putting that into your spirit. So as it is on the outside, so it is on the inside. This is why Jesus later called them whitewashed tombs. Like, you're dead, but you look really pretty sometimes with your robes. So this was a tradition, clean, 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 because we want to be clean, clean, clean in the Spirit. Okay, verse 5 says, And the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Why don't they, like, why is tradition not their foundation, Jesus? It's not their authority. And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it's written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. What is Jesus doing? He is taking apart certain things because Jesus is God. And if he is the clearest picture we have of God, he must be the authority. He's taking some things apart. And then he says... You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God. Oh, in, in verse 8, he says, You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. He is directly challenging a foundation that's not him. And then he said, And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. And he gives this example. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But I... Uh, but I say to you, if a man has his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. Here, here's what he's saying. In the law, in the Torah, it was on your father or mother. They built something on that. So the foundation was the authority of God, and then they built something. And, and here's what they built. They built this thing called Corbin, which means if you have possessions, if you have something, but you have family that are in need, it would be natural and right to sell your possessions to help your family in need, right? In fact, not just natural and right, if there's the poor and you want to help the poor, it would be natural and right and good and true to sell what you have and to help the poor. And then he said, but what they established was this idea of Corbin. If they declare that word, it would say, my possessions are now God's, they're not mine, and how convenient, I can't sell it anymore. He says, God's. I can't help the poor. I don't have to help mom and dad. And Jesus goes directly after that. And he takes it apart to establish his authority. Jesus, his whole life, was establishing his authority as the foundation for anyone who would have a relationship with God. Anyone that a relationship with God would be based on their relationship with him. Why? Because he is God. He's the clearest picture they have of God. He's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Let me show you this picture that you probably recognize. This is Mount Rushmore. I don't know if you've been to Mount Rushmore. It's not worth the drive from here, but it's pretty spectacular, okay? What you may not know is this picture. This was the, in the Black Hills of South Dakota, before Mount Rushmore was Mount Rushmore, this was it, okay? When I went to Mount Rushmore and I saw these massive faces, I remember being like asking, how long did it take to chisel that away? And they said, it didn't, they didn't chisel away in these mountains. Over 90% of how they got the faces in the mountain was through dynamite. Like, yeah, light a stick and throw. I mean, there was strategy to it, right? And it was from the 20s into the 40s, 1920s to the 1940s, that this project was done. And it, if you know some history, you'll know that's during the Great Depression, and there's a lot of trying times in America during that time. Sure, the roaring 20s party and all that stuff, but I'm saying, like, why'd they party? To forget. And why'd they forget? Because they're going through a hard time. The person over this project picked the top four faces that he believed got America through the hardest times before. Now, whether you agree with the four faces uh, he chose is, is not part of the issue. Those four faces, are the, this, is, this is the project. So they blew it up. They were trying to get a symbol of hope in this mountain. They're trying. And in order to do that, they had to use dynamite. Or 
for $8 a day, you could swing on down and chisel away. Now, eight fifty, I might do it. Eight bucks is real cheap, okay? <laughs> and then you have Mount Rushmore. This is what's happening right now is you, you would know people that if you said the term religion, tradition, church, that is a mountain. It's an immovable structure that's in their way. And that mountain right now has to be blown up to see Jesus. We have to see Jesus. People can't be convinced by just your interpretation of things. They can't just see the face of the church. They can't just see the face of your traditions. They have to see Jesus. And, and I believe if we can blow it up strategically and we can find hope today, and that's a Jesus-looking God. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians says, Remember our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ the Master. Meaning, my message is not about my preferences. That if I'm going to pass on my faith to my kids, um, I, I'm not trying to pass on all my preferences and call it the faith. It's not about that. It's about our master. We are messengers, errand runners from Jesus to you, from the mountain to back to the people to point them to Jesus. It started when God said, light up the darkness and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. How did we see and understand God? In the face of Jesus. Bright and beautiful. So I want to talk about how we get back to the authority of Jesus for a few minutes. And I want to give you an acronym for the word FUSE. Because it's probably you that's going through this. And so you can do this. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Don't throw Jesus out with the bathwater. And if it's not you, you can do this with someone you love. Your household needs you to know how to do this. Okay, the F stands for find the specific. Find the specific. What's the specific thing? What's the thing that you're like, okay, that's written on the block. That's the specific thing. What is it? Because Jesus, notice he did not do this. He didn't say to the Pharisees, and out with all of your tradition, all of your religion, get out of here. He's like getting very specific. He does it elsewhere as, as well. I'm thinking of when they said, Jesus, should we pay our taxes? Now, I do wish Jesus answered that differently, okay? But he gets real specific about uh, if it's actually about who you're committed to, but pay your taxes, but he gets real specific. Jesus continues to do this. Get specific. Nobody's deconstructing all of Christianity. That's impossible. But there are pieces, are there not, that we would say that does not reflect a Jesus-looking God. And we can't be scared to take those out and to make sure we have Jesus as our foundation. It, um, let, how many of you drink coffee? Coffee drinkers? Okay. All right, um, I'm going to ask it like this. How many of you drink wine? Just kidding. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I would expect that from 630. I would not expect that from you today at this service. Um, If you talk to a sommelier, which would be like someone who professionally tastes wine, or you talk to someone who tastes coffee professionally, there's actually a coffee tasting or a wine tasting, whatever, a, a wheel, a tasting wheel. And here's one of the things you're not allowed to say as you're tasting. You're not allowed to say smooth. Smooth is not a descriptor. It's not a taste. Smooth just means that's swallowable. That's what smooth means, okay? (laughs) You're not allowed to say it. But what you can do is this. Oh, that tastes fruity. They'd go, okay, what kind of fruit? Apricot, dried fig, whatever that is, you know, like apple, cherry. And they're going to refine your palate. Because they're getting specific. And in and, and my new book, Deconstruct Faith, Discover Jesus, tons of interviews and research in the book, but I took those stories and I created a deconstruction wheel where we go from big categories to small categories. And we're trying to get specific. What is the thing that you or the person you love has to say, I have to analyze this. I have questions about it. And if it's not Jesus... I'm going to set it aside for a faith that can withstand my life. The U stands for understand where it comes from. Understand where it comes from. Where does the thing come from? Jesus tells him, remember, he's like, okay, 
There is the word of God on your father and mother, but you all built on that. You built on the word of God, and you made it hard for people. He actually says, your traditions are keeping people from God. They're keeping people from God. Understand where it came from. Where did this thing that you're asking questions about, where did that come from? Is it based on the authority of Jesus? Is it based on Scripture? Um, and if it's not, can you loosen your grip a little? <laughs> And hold the person in front of you tighter than you're holding this thing. Like, I, I, listen, you can have your personal legalisms. I don't want them. You can have yours. Um, I have my own. You can have your personal preferences. You can have your personal biases. But what you cannot do is we cannot say, that's the faith, and then expect everybody to want it. What we need to do is get back to Jesus. Is this, where does this thing come from that I'm asking questions about? I don't have a good transition into this next thing, so I'm just going to tell you, I would like to talk to you about lobsters for a second, okay? Lobsters. Lobsters um, are like cockroaches of the sea. They're bottom feeders. They're garbage. They're very expensive now, but lobsters used to be cheaper than like Pop-Tarts. I mean, lobsters were cheap. Lobsters were actually given to prisoners. They would wash up on the East Coast. They would just make a pile there on the shore, and they're given to prisoners because they are nasty. They're gross. And then whenever they built the railroad system going from the East Coast to the West Coast, they needed some dish that they can elevate, that they could make a delicacy that people with wealth weren't used to. They got lobsters. Now, I don't know when lobsters had melted butter. That's the part that does it for me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm in now, which surprisingly elevates any dish if you just put melted butter on it. But that... For them, they took the, the bottom feet, the nasty, the garbage, and they said, here's the main course. Here's the delicacy for you to feast on. Um, have we not done that in Christianity? Have we not taken our preferences, our biases, and said, that's the main course? And then you have a whole generation that's like, ah, this looks like garbage. And what we need to do is be willing to say, Maybe I can let that go because it's not based on Jesus' authority. Because I'm going to get to Jesus, and I want to pass this faith off. The S stands for share the impact. Share the impact. What's the impact this has on you? As you are deconstructing faith or you're walking with someone who's deconstructing faith, what's the impact this has on you? I'm telling you, Jesus leads the way on this. Yes, there's a wrong way to do it. There's a wrong way to do anything in life. But Jesus leads the way. He leads the way when it comes to making sure his authority is what people are building their lives on. Share the impact. We, we started an organization years ago called the Doubters Club. We get Christians and non-Christians who are friends. The, the mission of this is model friendship and pursue truth together. That's the mission. And they're like, well, what, what about conversion and all stuff? I'm like, well, we're talking reconciliation. We just want people to be able to come together who think differently. And we believe you don't have to think the same way to be friends. There's doubters clubs all over the world, but one of the most impactful things that happens, it's never in a church, by the way, it's always coffee shop, whatever. And one of the most impactful things is when they share the impact of their journey. And then you have someone else, they'll share the impact of maybe what the church has done to them. Then you have someone else sharing the impact of Jesus. And you can see the stark contrast and you realize, wow, we must have Jesus as our foundation. And then the E stands for engage with what remains. This is the fuse. This is the fuse method. If, if you want more information on this, it's in the book, but I, I just want to tell you, like, if your father, I'm telling you, you got to build your house this way. Otherwise, um, don't call it Christian. It has to be built on Jesus. It's confusing people. And if you're not a father in the room, you have a dad, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you're like, what remains in the end? What remains when it, I, I know I should have written Jesus on the bottom layer. I didn't. But the pro, you're like, what remains when we get to the foundation? And, and let me tell you what remains. The creator of the universe remains. Uh, w when I was in Bible college, I had a ton of doubts. And I'm not going to tell you which Bible college. It wasn't their fault. It was my fault. And I went to well-meaning people. And I remember doing this, like, hey, I have a lot of doubts. I don't even know if I want to be Christian anymore. And I had them, someone prayed, a pastor prayed for me. 
that uh, trying to cast out the demon of doubt. Another one told me this, well, same one, told me to sleep on the Bible, like osmosis. Like, I don't know if it's because I, it was, I was sleeping on the NIV and not the ESV or the NLT. <laughs> they also told me, play more worship music, just listen to worship music. And you're like, there is nothing more frustrating than memorizing a Hillsong album whenever you don't even know if you believe anymore. And I tried all these things. Because my foundation, I was built on experience. I built my faith on experience. And then I had more experiences that <laughs> challenged that experience. And then I had someone, I'm going to tell you in a nutshell kind of what was convincing for me. Um, this was over the process of eight months, okay? Eight months that, of, of just discipleship. But what was convincing to me is this. Someone was talking to me like this. And they committed their life to me. They said, I don't care where you land as long as you're honest. And here's how I know who remains. He said, do you believe the universe is created? I'm like, yeah. I mean, even science would say it's created. And if you're listening or watching online and you're like, no, science would say Big Bang. Well, the Big Bang would be the created point. But I'm saying it, the universe didn't last forever. There was a point the universe was created. And then, and then it's like, okay, so is the creator personal or impersonal? It's a big question, isn't it? Is the creator of the universe personal or impersonal? And you're like, oh, well, I don't know, like everything's kind of lined up and, and love is a really big ethic in the world. It's not just an ethic, it unites everybody. When we sing all tribes and all nations, there's something that lights up in us because we know unity and love is supposed to be in, I think you'd probably say with me, it's personal. The creator would be personal. And then it's like, okay, did God, did that personal being ever reveal themselves to you? or at all in history. If the personal being that created the universe is love, they would have to have revealed themselves. Let me give this illustration on Father's Day. Um, if, if one of the most unloving things I could do, if my daughters, let's say they've never met me before, and they went up to every man with a beard and glasses, and they're like, are you my dad? Are you my dad? Are you my dad? It's like half of America, right? Are you my dad? Are you my dear dad? And if I sat back and crossed my arms, and I'm like, I can't believe they, I'm in Bakersfield, California, right? I'm like, why can't they just find me? That's so unloving. That's so unloving. I would not be a loving dad. The most loving thing I could do is to go to them and reveal myself to them and say, hey, Piper and Brennan, I'm your dad. Like, I'm your dad. Give me a hug. Smell me. Let me kiss you on the cheek. Let me throw you in the air. Let me keep you safe. Feel my embrace. Everything else is superficial similarity, but i got to reveal myself to you because you're looking for me because you want your dad. And this is what God did. The personal creator of the universe came to earth in Jesus and said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. He is God. And all the confusion of what Christianity is and what's embedded in it and what's being built on it and why is it so hard to see and all this stuff, all of that's really important that you pick apart. But the foundation, the thing that will always remain is the creator. And the creator is personal. The personal creator has revealed himself to us. And he's revealed himself to us because he loves us. He doesn't want you to be afraid of him. And whoever told you God can't be in the presence of sin, so get your life right, doesn't know about Jesus, apparently. Because Jesus walked among sinners and touched them and did life with them. And if God can't be in the presence of sin, then... So much for my relationship with him. But he wants a deep personal relationship. And it happened in history, but it doesn't just happen in history back there. It's happening now today that the personal creator would say, I would like to reveal myself to you again. Deconstruction gets us to the foundation of the authority of Jesus. And then we always get to make the decision when we see the face of Jesus in the mountain, what do we do with Jesus? Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.